So how many of you needed to hear that? <laughs> More than just one, brother. Thank you. Did, did I hear you right that you learned that song at camp? It's pretty cool. I mean, it shows you a... Uh, uh, well, I got you, I got you, but just, uh, the, you know, it's kind of a testimony of how camp can be a, a blessing to us uh, and how it can be such a transformational time for young people. Praise God. Um, would you pray with me? Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, uh, it is a joy and privilege to be able to stand before you and be a conduit of your word. I pray that you would be heard and felt known in this place that I would be removed and uh, it would be your power and your spirit that would speak to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I've mentioned before, I hate waiting. <laughs> you know, of all the, the virtues and vices and, and things that the Bible talks about, I know when I read about the fruit of the Spirit, um, patience, is, is one that I, I really struggle with. This is one of the reasons why I, I don't like standing in line. You won't see me too often at potluck uh, waiting at the back of the line. Um, I'm more than happy to mingle, walk around, chat with people, and let, let others go through. It's just, I hate waiting. <laughs> I'd rather do other things. It's one of the things I'm working on uh, in my life and is going to continue to be a thing. You know, people that are impatient um, are irritable, uh, are arrogant, are stubborn. Now, I'm not any of those things. But other people who are impatient, they struggle with that. Me, uh, I handle it just fine. No, that's not true. Uh, waiting. The waiting. Waiting. I want to have the kids help me out this morning with our kids quiz. And uh, so if you just raise your hand, love to have you interact. I'm looking around, making sure I know where you are, kind of spread out here. Um, so we'll just uh, see what we can come up with here. Who is this first talking about? Quoting, so he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove. Who are we talking about here? All right, I saw Owen's hand first, but I'm going to let Jacob go because you're our sound engineer, Owen. That feels like it'd be favoritism. So. That's right. You got it. Noah. And when you think about the experience of the flood, uh, there's a lot of waiting involved there. They have to wait for the flood waters to subside. Then, uh, and, and that's a symbol of God's judgment coming to an end. And they have to wait to see if... It's if it you know life has come back and and a lot of waiting in the story of Noah. Number two, he wanted to start a family, but had to wait twenty years until his wife Rebecca had their first children. Emmett, you got this one. It's not Jacob. You're thinking in the right family, but it's not Jacob. Let's give someone else a chance. Who are we talking about? All right, Toby, we're going to give you a chance here. This is Isaac. Isaac, and it's very subtle. Um, you have to look at it in the, uh, in the verse. Okay, I don't know if you did that or if I did it. Um, sometimes this thing's a little tricky. The way you read Genesis, it skips over this so quickly. It simply says, so Isaac married Rebekah, but Rebekah was barren. And so Isaac prayed for his wife, and she became pregnant. I mean, literally, when you read Genesis 25, that's basically what it says. Isaac married Rebecca, uh, but Rebecca was barren, so Isaac prayed for his wife, his wife, and she became pregnant. But when you read further, you realize that he gets married at the age of 40, and, and Jacob and Esau are not born until he's 60. So that little, you got to look at the context. Sometimes, oh, what an act of faith. You know, they got married on a, a Friday and, but you know, couldn't have a baby, but by Sunday she's pregnant. It makes it sound like it's that fast. And sometimes we have to remember, you know, sometimes God waits to answer our prayers. Sometimes there's a lot of waiting when we pray. A father brought his suffering son to Jesus. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father answered, 
A, B, C, or D. About a year from childhood, started just today, a few weeks. Do you know this one? Some of our young people, I, I know where you're Oh, Caleb. Come on, Caleb. Let us know. Shout it out. He says, from childhood. You are right. That's right. Now, this is an interesting thing, and this, is a, this comes from the Gospel of Mark. Um, and it's another one of those stories. You sometimes, when you read about someone bringing a, a son or a daughter to Jesus, I don't know about you, but I tend to think of them as young, right? They, you know, a father brings, but how long are you a child to your parent? Just until you're 18? No, this individual could have been in his 30s or his 40s because the father answers from childhood. In other words, he's not a child anymore, right? From childhood, he's been afflicted with this, this problem. Um, and we know that many of the miracles that Jesus does are for people. The suffering didn't just begin that week or that, that day. Some of them struggled with the suffering that Jesus healed with them for years and decades. Remember the woman that had the issue of blood? That was, I think that was 12 years, wasn't it? There was the woman who uh, had the spirit that kept her bent over. I think that was 30 years. And then some people, they said, you know, you know, this man was born blind. He had been blind his entire life. And they had to wait. They had to wait until the Messiah could come into their experience. Waiting. Oh, so hard to do. Older Bible translations like to use this word for patience. Slowness, persistence, doggedness, long-suffering, godliness. What is kind of the King James version for patience? What word there makes the most sense? All right, Owen, I, I say your hand, Caleb, but we're going to give Owen a chance here. Sorry, Gio, was that what you were going to say too? What were you going to say, Gio? Godliness? All right. So it, it's, it's really the long suffering. Long suffering. And there's just something more visceral about that word when you think of patience, isn't there? You know, patience is a, a virtue. We want to be patient. But when you think of it as long suffering, it adds to the, uh, it adds to the reality of what that is. And when you think of it in the context of Galatians, this is from the King James, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. That's what patience is. Suffering long. When you stand in line at potluck, that is long suffering. Because you can smell that food and you want that. When you go to the motor vehicle department, man, that is long suffering. Standing in those lines. Gentleness, goodness, all of those things. And so sometimes looking at it in different ways helps us. All right, last one. Last one. Finish this verse, Revelations 14, Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who do these two things. Keep the something of God and the something of Jesus. What's the first one? Here are they who keep the... All right, we're gonna let, I saw Geo first. Geo? Keep the blessing of God. That's really good. I like that. That's not quite what the verse says, though. So I think Emmett, Emmett's going to help us, okay? What do you got for us, Emmett? Keep the commandments of God. All right, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the Addy. Testimony, it says that in another place in Revelation, so it's very close. It's almost there. It's not testimony. But that's a good answer. That's a right answer. Just a little bit different here. All right, Anna. That's right. Keep the, and, and the faith, and the faith of Jesus. So even in the book of Revelation, the saints are defined by their patience and their perseverance. Um, much of the story of the Bible is about God's people waiting. I mean, going right back to creation, when Adam and Eve fall, and God comes and He proclaims the consequences of sin. And He says that the day is going to come when the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. From that time until now, the fulfillment of that promise continues to be a waiting, right? We know that Satan's defeated. We know that he is, uh, you know, he's a failure. But has he been fully uh, uh, removed from our experience yet? 
He's not. We're still waiting, right? Um, the patriarchs waiting to be able to have children. How old was uh, old Abraham before he has Isaac? You remember how old he was? This, is, this isn't part of the kids' quiz. You're allowed, a church family, to participate at this point. How old was Abraham? Toby? He was 100, all right? He's 100 years old. And we talk about Isaac having to wait 20 years before uh, his wife is able to have. Jacob, how long did Jacob have to wait before he could marry Rachel? Are we tired or do we not know our Bibles? I didn't mean for these to be trick questions. 14 years. 14 years for, for him. He fell in love with her. He wants to marry her, but he has to work. He gets tricked, right? He thinks after seven years, hey, we're in good shape. I've worked the seven. Uh, let's have the celebration. Let's have Rachel come into the tent and we're good. Uh, then the, then uh, old his, uh, uncle says, uh-uh, no, I've changed it. You misunderstood. Uh, you're going to have to change things up. He had to work an additional seven. He had to wait. Uh, you think of the Israelites in Egypt, in slavery, waiting for a deliverer. And then you have uh, uh, the Jews in Babylon, waiting to get out of captivity. You even have the prophets crying out, How long, O Lord, until the vision's complete? How long do we have to wait? On one of those famous verses to Seventh-day Adventists in Daniel chapter 8, is Daniel 8.14, right? But right before that, in Daniel 8.13, Daniel hears uh, uh, the vision say, How long? How long until uh, uh, the, the, the vision of the daily is accomplished and the transgression which causes horror and the trampling of the holy place and of the host? How long? And the answer is given in Daniel 8.14, under 2,300 2, evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be restored. It's an answer to the question of patience, an answer to the question of how long do we get Daniel 8.14. The Jews had to wait to be getting out of captivity Babylon. Even in the New Testament, the Jews were waiting for the Messiah. We haven't had prophecy since Malachi. We have, it's been 400 years since the Lord has spoken through prophets. We don't have the Urim and the Thummim. We don't have anyone to speak to us. We need the Messiah. When will he come? That's what Anna and, and Simeon in the temple were waiting for when Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to be dedicated. It says that they were waiting in the temple. They had been waiting their entire lives waiting 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 all the people that jesus healed many of the people that jesus healed years decades of affliction waiting for god to come and do something powerful in their lives and what are we waiting for right now what is the church waiting for in the last days what are we waiting for what is the great hope that we are waiting for it's the coming of christ isn't it that's it's in our name we are seventh day adventists we're waiting for the advent of christ and I hate waiting. I'm tired of waiting. It's football season, football playoff season to be more accurate. I apologize if I use too many illustrations from pop culture and, and uh, politics and sports and everything. But the thought struck me. In football in particular, there's an interesting thing that happens in the playoffs. Teams, this year it's different because they've expanded the playoffs, but teams that have the best winning record, okay, they get seeded the highest in playoffs, and they get what's called a bye. They get a bye. And that, what that means is the, 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 team, the, the team or teams that have the best record, they don't have to play for one week of the playoffs. They automatically advance, all right? And it's a great advantage. It's something that you know that you want to have. You want to be able to advance to the next level without even having to play a game, right? So they get a bye. So while they sit back and watch for a week, they're resting, they're healing, they're studying the films, they're getting ready for their game, and they're having to watch their opponents play that week, knowing that one of them they're going to get to play. I, I apologize. I don't want to go into more detail than that. If this is uh, foggy to you, you can uh, Google it later of how... Uh, NFL playoffs work. But it's very interesting. I don't know of any other sport that does it like this, where the top teams get to basically skip uh, a, a part of the playoffs, and they just automatically advance. And we know statistically it's a huge advantages, and teams that get that usually go further than others that, that don't. But here's what I want to point out to you. Many players and coaches both have talked about that period of waiting. And they've said that is one of the most difficult things to do is to sit there and watch your opponents play 
Even though you're getting to rest and you're getting to study and you're getting to prepare, and it is a great advantage, they get home field advantage as well, but that, that thing of watching your opponents play. Now, these, these players are competitors. They want to fight. They want to get out there and get it done, right? And they have to sit and watch their opponent, and they have to keep their focus. They have to keep their edge. They have to keep uh, you know, being prepared for that, but they have to sit and they have to wait because it's not their turn yet. They're already in the playoffs. They're already going to the next level, but they have to wait. Now, in a way, forgive me for any kind of a woodenness here to the illustration, I kind of think that there's an element of that that resonates with the church. We are in the playoffs, right? We're getting to the, we're getting close to the championship, aren't we? Stick with me here, folks, with the analogy. Emmett, are you with me on this one? You're good? All right. We are getting toward the final game. Okay. That's the second coming, Declan. You might whisper it to your dad. He looks a little confused. Okay. That's the second coming. That's the final event. This is the last challenge, the final conflict. We're getting there. And we know that we're advancing, right? We know that we are going to be there, that we are going to get into that championship, that last final conflict. We're going to be there. But at the moment, we got to wait. We got to wait. We've gotten a buy. And I hate it. Because has our enemy stopped fighting? Has our enemy given up? No, we're having to stop and wait and watch. And what I, I, I may have gotten ahead of my skis a little bit here, Vince, so I'm going to have to take it back a little bit. Here's what I mean. We've been dealing with this COVID issue for two years. And it has forced us to do things very different. And I'm tired of waiting. I want to get back to evangelism. I want to get back to fellowship. I want to get back to Sabbath school. I want to get back to Bible studies. I want to get back to community service. I want to get back to baptisms. I want to get back to church. But every single time that it seems like, hey, we've got a window, we've got an opportunity. Here comes the next variant. Here comes the next outbreak. And don't, don't, please understand me. I am not in any way trying to say these are not significant issues. I'm not in any way trying to say that these are uh, 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 you know, manufactured or anything. They are realities of our world that we're in right now. But kind of like Lucy with the football, you know, and Charlie Brown, right? When you, just when you think, I'm going to kick that ball. And, and, and Lucy said, you guys know Charles Schultz? I mean, I just, sometimes I don't know. I grew up in a different state. You guys do things differently down here. Okay, Charles Schultz, peanuts, Charlie Brown, right? You know, there's that thing with Charlie Brown kicking the football. And you know that Lucy pulled that football away from him every year for 50 years. Charles Schultz made sure there was at least one panel every year of Lucy pulling the football away. So for one year, for, for 50 years, Lucy would tell Charlie Brown, okay, I won't do it to you this time. This time I'm going to let you kick it. And Charlie Brown, okay, now you didn't, you pulled it away from me last time. You really going to let me kick it? Oh yeah, Charlie Brown, I'm going to let you kick it. And he would get up his speed. He'd say, this time I'm going to kick that ball to the moon. And what would she do? Every single time she'd pull that ball away and he'd flip around, fall on his back. Never learn a lesson. And Charles Schultz even wrote, when he did his last panel, he said it dawned on me that I'd never let Charlie Brown kick the football. And it was with great sadness that I came to that realization. However, I knew that if I did let him kick that ball, it would have forever altered the personality of Charlie Brown. But I feel like that sometimes. I feel like I'm ready to get, get this game going. I'm ready to get back out in the field. I'm ready to, I want to get back to what the things that we do as a church. I'm, I want to get back to getting active again and doing things. And right when I go to kick that football, boom, pulls away from me. I don't like waiting. And like I said, it's not like during these last few years, it's not like the devil said, well, I'm going to take time off too. While the church stops doing its thing, I'll stop doing my thing. Now, I realize the Lord knows uh, what is happening here. He is not caught off guard. And I'm not saying that we have been totally stagnant during this time, that there haven't been powerful, wonderful, miraculous things that God has done in our community. And we do need to rethink how we do some things. You know, maybe this is a time of learning and growing and adapting for us to the church, and that's fine. But I'm still waiting. You know what I mean? Is that fair? Uh, is, is this resonating with you? 
and I want to get into the game. I know that we're in the championship. I know that we're moving forward, but I want to get back in the game. I don't preach from Romans very often, but when I came upon this passage, it was like the Lord just gripped me with it and said, this is where we're going. So um, let me share with you what, how the Lord spoke to me about this in the book of Romans. And the verses will be on the screen for the most part. Uh, you can follow along there. You can turn in your Bibles. Look at what Paul says here in Romans chapter um, 8. Romans chapter 8. Here's what he says. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time. Interesting. He understood what sufferings were. Do we understand that there's sufferings in our present time too? The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is be, to be revealed to us. Now, uh, I'm going to have to restrain myself because there's so much we can unpack with each part, but what Paul is basically saying here, and he'll use childbirth as a, an illustration later, later on in this, verse, in this uh, passage, is that yes, there's suffering, and the suffering's real, but the product of that suffering, the result of that suffering, is going to be so wonderful, the suffering will be worth it. Just like childbirth, I'm told. I've heard that there is suffering engaged with that, but the result of having that child is worth it. Is that, is that okay? That's what Paul is saying here. It's the sufferings of this present time. They're real, but God has something so glorious if we will hold on through this time that we're, it's going to be beyond our, our comprehension. For the anxious longing of the creation does what? Does it, did it appear up here? Can you see it right there? For the anxious longing of the creation waits. Waits. We're not the only ones waiting. We're not the only ones caught up in this great controversy. Paul here says the, longing, uh, the anxious longing of the creation waits. Now, uh, a, a lot of interpretation and, and uh, 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 sub, you know, trying to understand what he's talking about here could be made. I'm going to argue to you that Paul is not just talking, because creation's waiting, some people say, well, that's the angels and that's humans, because in order to wait, you've got to have a mind. And he's not talking about, you know, rocks and trees and rivers and things like that. However, I, I think he is talking about a more universal sense of creation, okay? It's not just humanity and angels and and uh, uh, sentient worlds uh, uh, spanned throughout the galaxies that's waiting. I do believe that this is a holistic, uh, perhaps metaphorical, but a holistic analysis that even inanimate nature realizes that something is wrong and is waiting for redemption. And I, I, I think that that will become clear in just a second, and I'll explain why I think that's important. The anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the, the revealing of the sons of God is just the end of the great controversy. Okay, those who have accepted grace, those who have accepted Christ, those who are saved, those who have uh, moved on in their uh, 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 redemption with Jesus Christ, and those who haven't. Let's wrap this up. Let's get it over with. Even creation is waiting for that. He goes on to say, for the creation was subjected to futility. And what he's just saying here is death, decay, corruption. And he says, talks about slavery to corruption later. It doesn't mean purposelessness. That's the important thing. Futility can sometimes mean that. That's not what he means. He just means that it's temporal. Okay? The earth is subject to the brokenness of sin and the futility of death, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. I want to just uh, get to this next part. For we know, and here's where he says, that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Now, um, again, I'm not wanting to suggest some sort of pantheistic idea of creation or, or animism or anything, but doesn't Jesus say on the triumphal entry when the Pharisees said, hey, you need to keep these people quiet. They're, they're shouting Hosanna. We don't want to hear. Remember what Jesus says? If these remain quiet, even the stones will cry out. Didn't Jesus say that? Do you remember that in your Bible study? Okay. Now, whether he was being metaphorical or exaggerating, I don't know. The Bible in the Old Testament talks about cle uh, trees and rivers clapping their hands and things like that. We say, oh, that's symbolism. And I do. I, I, I believe that. But the interesting thing is, is even when Jesus, who's caught in the storm, calls out to the storm, and he calls out to the wind and the waves, he speaks to them. 
And he says, hush, be quiet, be still. And they obey. And it says that the disciples were overwhelmed with the realization that even inanimate nature, even the winds and the waves could hear the voice of Jesus and obey. Now, so what I'm just trying to say here is that Paul is saying even all of creation, the rocks, the trees, the rivers, everything is subject to corruption and all of that is waiting for the final redemption of God's people. All creation, angels, all of the universe that God has made, they all groan together and suffer the pains, here it is, of childbirth together until now. We are all caught up in this together. We are all waiting. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. This is just something I had not really dawned on me before. But when Paul says that we have the first fruits of the Spirit, do you know what the first fruits were? When you brought your sacrifices to God, this is very, you know, a cultural expression. This is something that the Jews and people of the ancient world would understand when it came to sacrifice and giving to God. What were the first fruits? It was the best of your harvest. It was the ripest. It was the purest. It was that when, when you brought your sacrifices to God, you weren't supposed to bring the leftovers. You weren't supposed to bring the blemished, right? You were to bring the best. So when Paul says we have the first fruits of the Spirit, what is he telling us? We have the best. That the Holy Spirit has poured into our lives not a minimal amount, not a, not a, 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 a corrupted amount, not a secondary part of His presence, not, a, not a, a, a lacking element of His power. He has given us the first fruits, the best of the Holy Spirit, the best that God has to offer. And even with that, even having the first fruits of the Spirit, we, even in that midst, groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. Now, what's interesting about that is earlier on in Romans, in verse uh, uh, 16, Paul says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. So in verse 16, he says, we are the children of God. But down here in verse 23, he says, we're waiting for our adoption. You say, well, how does that work? Well, I think a, a partial... Uh, uh, explanation could be in a way the adoption papers have been signed all the legal uh, elements have been satisfied now we're just waiting for him to come pick us up from the orphanage all right we are his children it's been settled it's been done all the necessary fees have been paid all the necessary elements have been satisfied we're just waiting we're on the curb waiting for his car to come down the road to come pick us up so we can go home with him we're waiting. We're eagerly waiting for our adoption as sons. I love how Paul sums this together. We could, uh, you can see I've, I've, I've made a little bit of a gap between verse 25. We're going to jump down to the end of the chapter because I like how Paul brings this all together here in the end. Oh, I haven't got to verse 25 yet. I apologize. For in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he already sees, which is very logical. You don't hope for something if you have it. Um, we, it's been promised, and we, we believe in that promise, but we don't have it yet. But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, another term for patience and endurance, we wait eagerly for it. It's, it's almost like it's been God's plan from the very beginning that waiting and patience is necessary for our spiritual growth, as much as I hate it. My, oh my. How long did Jesus have to wait before he could jump in the game, right? Before he could come as a human, right? He had to wait. Notice how Paul closes out this chapter here in Romans. For I am convinced. If you don't have that highlight, if you don't have that circled or underlined, if you don't have that shining forth from your scriptures, friends, I am convinced. Convinced. Well, there's power in saying that. I'm persuaded. I am resolved. I'm adamant. I know that I know. I am convinced. Let's say this together, church. Repeat after me. I am convinced. You don't sound very convinced to me. Let's try it again. I 
am convinced. The, through all this waiting, through all this patience, I am convinced. I know that neither, and he begins right at the, 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 the deepest of them, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, principality, nor power, nor things present, things to come, the powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us. You know, in the beginning, it says that it's not uh, good for man to be alone. We're not meant to be separated. And sin has created separation. And COVID has created separation. And Omicron has created separation. And policies have created separation. But what is going to separate us from the love of God? Nothing. None of these things will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am convinced that He is still coming. I am convinced that those who I love who've died will be redeemed when Jesus comes. I am convinced that ultimate healing will come to my daughter and she won't have autism in heaven. I am convinced that God is still on our side. I am convinced that we're still going to win the final battle. I am convinced that Jesus is still coming. I am convinced that nothing will separate us from the love of God, even though I'm waiting. I'm waiting. We will not wait forever. Habakkuk says, Habakkuk says, though it tarries, it will surely come. It will surely come. He is coming, friends. He is doing great things in our world and in our lives.